Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight Latino Voices. I'm Joanna Hernandez on the show tonight. Mayor Johnson is set to ask City Council for an additional $70 million for migrant care. This is an international global crisis that requires a federal response. Advocates push for expanded work permits. Research shows increasing suicide rates among Black and Latino Chicagoans. A look at potential causes and solutions. We are building a different image of Latinos. And grab your bag of popcorn. Chicago Latino Film Festival kicks off today. What you need to know. And now to some of today's top stories. O.J. Simpson, the former football star famously acquitted of a double homicide in the 90s, has died. Simpson is regarded as one of the greatest running backs of all time. His professional success, though, became overshadowed after he was charged with the 1994 murder of his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ron Goldman. Simpson was acquitted in what is often referred as a trial of the century. His family announced his death on social media earlier today, saying he died of prostate cancer. He was 76. The Uber app is adding taxis to its list of ride options in Chicago. Starting today, Chicago drivers can book a taxi through the app. Uber says the new partnership with the taxi industry will offer riders more options while benefiting cab drivers financially. The rideshare company has long been blamed for a decline in the taxi industry. Uber says riders will still receive upfront pricing in the app when selecting a taxi. And mark your calendar. This Saturday is the sixth annual Latino Health Equity Fest Fiesta Tour. In an effort to promote health equity, the event will offer breast exams, HIV testing, dental checkups, health screenings, and DNA testing, among other services. Organizers say the event is free to everyone, regardless of citizenship status, and all services are free. This year's event will be at the Instituto del Progreso Latino High School from 10 to 3 p.m. Up next, additional funds for migrant care. That's right after this. Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, is made possible in part by the support of these donors. Mayor Brendan Johnson is expected to ask City Council to spend an additional $70 million to care for migrants sent to Chicago from the southern border. The request comes six weeks after the mayor declined to join Governor J.B. Pritzker and Cook County Board President Tony Preprinkle in setting aside more money to confront the humanitarian crisis. Reporter Heather Sharon joins us now with more. Heather, first question, tell us why the city needs more money to care for migrants. Well, it is an acknowledgement that there is no help financially coming from the federal government despite nearly a year of impassioned pleas from Mayor Johnson and other city officials. It is acknowledgement that the city, along with some help from the state and the county, is essentially on its own caring for tens of thousands of migrants who have made their way to Chicago, becoming our city's newest residents. And talking about money, state and county officials agreed to spend $250 million to care for the migrants back in February, but until now the mayor declined to join them. Why? Well, there was a deep breach opened up between the state and the city over the issue of the winterized base camp that was supposed to open in Brighton Park this past winter. It never did, even though the state had promised to operate a shelter of nearly 2,000 beds. That left Mayor Brandon Johnson feeling like he was in the lurch, struggling to figure out how to care for it all of these people who are now in Chicago. He, it's also not clear whether the city council will approve this money because the last time the city council was asked to approve funds for the city council, it was a huge fight even though the mayor set aside only $150 million this year, knowing full well that was probably less than half of what the city would need. And when, this, when is the city council scheduled to vote on this request? Well, it will face its first test on Monday at 2 p.m. when the budget committee takes up this proposal. If it wins the endorsement of that committee, a final vote could happen as soon as Wednesday. I think this is going to be another tough fight for the mayor. Well, we're going to have to wait and see. Thank you, Heather, for the update. Thanks, Joanna. Up next, the debate over expanding work permits.
Advocates are pushing for expanding access to work permits for migrants and long-term undocumented immigrants. Mayor Brandon Johnson and other proponents say expanding work permits will boost the U.S. workforce and the economy. But opponents say local taxpayers will have to pay and they should be protected. Joining us now with more are Laura Mendoza, immigration organizer at the Resurrection Project. And joining us via Zoom is Republican State Senator Andrew Chesney. Thank you both for joining us today. Now, Senator, I want to go to you. What are some of the risks that you see in extending work permits to all undocumented immigrants? Well, it's going to drive down the wages for the American worker. And I think that we have to prioritize the American worker that uh, has done it the right way the entire time. And uh, the U.S. citizens uh, are going to be penalized because it's going to drive down the wages for them. And for those reasons, I think we need to be incredibly cautious for any expansions. And Laura, going to you from what are you saying, what are some of the benefits of extending work permits to undocumented citizens? And yeah. what can that provide? Yeah, so I don't think it would actually bring down the wages. I think we, what we are saying is we definitely want those fair wages to be upheld. We want to make sure that people are part of the formal economy and that are paying taxes, right, and that those um, laws for fair wages are upheld. A lot of the times people who are working without documents um, have to take a job that pays less, that is maybe working them more hours without um, equal pay. And so we want to make sure that they're protected and they're able to go and they're able to demand their rights as workers um, and be able to have those rights that have been tirelessly worked for for um, workers to be protected. So that's what a work permit would allow us to do. And Laura, you attended a meeting last week with the mayor and other local leaders pushing the Here to Work campaign. What are some of the goals of this initiative and what was the scene like at that meeting? Yeah. the in uh, the purpose is to expand work permits for all, um, especially to people who have been undocumented in the U.S. for now decades. We're talking about the average um, time that people have been undocumented, about 16 years. Um, so we want to make sure that they have some protections. Um, I think it was a, a wonderful, it was wonderful to be part of that meeting, to see people from different sectors, from the private sectors, um, to faith leaders, to civic leaders, all coming together and saying this is a protection that is needed for people who have been here, who have been contributing to this country, who have been making this country what it is now. And Senator, what are your thoughts? How do you feel that the goals of the Here to Work campaign could backfire? Well, I think that first we have to we have to say what it is, and there are, there are illegal immigrants that have come here legally, uh, regardless of how long they've been here. They're illegal immigrants, and you can't add millions and mil millions of people to the workforce and expect it to have no impact on the wages for the legal citizens that are here that are residing not only our state but also our country. But if you if you want to expand beyond that, and if you think the illegal immigration and migrant crisis is bad now. If you formalize that, you are literally opening up the floodgates, even worse than they already have. Uh, that that J.B. Pritzker and 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 Mayor Johnson and, and others have essentially rolled out the red carpet for migrants and illegal immigrants to come to the state of Illinois, and we just can't sustain it. And it's siphoning off resources for those that have have lived that live here legally and have for for decades. And so I think it comes down to priorities. We certainly have empathy, but we also have a finite amount of dollars that we can spend in this state. And we are siphoning off billions and billions of dollars for migrants and illegal immigrants that should be should be used for lawful citizens of our state. Lara, what is your comment on that? Because there are undocumented people who are paying taxes. Yeah, we have people who have been here for years contributing. So it is not about that. And I also think it's important to think about the workforce as an ecosystem, right? You need those farmers um, to be picking those crops. You need people that are going to pick those crops that are then going to be sold, that are then going to go to restaurants, right? All of that is a chain where you need people working. And what we know is that we do not have enough workers in the U.S. to fulfill all of the vacancies that are available. And so we need immigrants to come and, and actually we need immigrants who are here to be able um, to, to take on those, those positions that are, that are open and that are able to them that are then going to continue to grow the economy the way that it has um, worked for many years. And Senator, what is your input on that? Because there has been, it has been said that there is a need for more workers in, in different uh, industries. You know, what do you say to that? I think it's insulting to the American worker to suggest that the only people that can pick crops are illegal immigrants. I think that the American workers are the best uh, best workers in this in this world, and uh, we we certainly have to put them first and, and foremost in our policy decisions. And so, putting 
literally millions and millions of people uh, legally, uh, giving them legal work status within our country will not only open the floodgates on our southern border further than it already is, but it will also drive down the wages for those for those that I represent. And, and that for those reasons, I simply cannot support it. And another question, are American jobs, are they at risk? Well, of course they're at risk, right? I mean, you you know, you can't legalize an illegal activity and expect that those are not going to siphon off jobs from legal taxpayers and U.S. citizens. And so it, it, it's not about empathy. It's about it's about priorities. And I think as a state and a nation, we need to prioritize those that have done it the right way and legal citizens, those that that vote us into office. And that doesn't mean we can't have compassion and empathy and legal pass forward for citizenship, but they need to do it the right way. And we, we have a lot of people that are being impacted uh, by, by record inflation numbers, high gas prices, and et cetera. And you can't uh, change the workforce environment expected to have no impact on the most vulnerable, which is who it will impact the most, is the poor and the working poor that are here legally. Lara, what, what do you say when he says the right way? Yeah, I mean, you know, nobody wants to be undocumented. I was able to obtain DACA when I was 24. I, it wasn't like I was like, yes, I want to be undocumented, right? This was a really tough choice that my parents had to make in order for their family to stay together, for their family to be able to thrive. So nobody wants to be undocumented. Nobody's looking for that. It is really, really difficult. And we also have to think about that there is no path, right? Like I continue to just have a protection of DACA because that is the only thing that is available to me. Those people who are undocumented, who have been here for 16, 20, 30 years, they don't have a path to anything, right? So when I hear, you know, you have to do it the legal way, nothing has been open for people. I understand, right, they came and they crossed the border, but, you know, they've been here, they've been contributing, so it is time. And talking about that, there hasn't been an immigration reform policy since amnesty during the Reagan era in 1986. What would you say, what's next for immigration reform? Yeah, I mean, if anything, it's been harder, right? We had the 1996 IRA-IRA that made it even more difficult, that penalized people for, for crossing the border. Um, you know, I. You know, another thing that the senator mentioned was, you know, people that put him into office. There's a lot of mixed status families. There are a lot of parents to U.S. citizen children that are coming of age that are getting ready to vote. And those same parents are still undocumented. So that is also, you know, a big demographic that people have to be conscious of. But they, these are families that want to stay together and are not able to stay together because there has been nothing offered to them. And Senator, going to you, why should the government be conscious about immigration reform? And what does immigration reform mean look like to you? Well, I mean, there's a federal fix, and I'm on the state level, so I can only speak to the state level because I'm not in Congress in the U.S. Senate, so I'd refer the, the federal debate for a, for a federal legislator. But I can tell you what we need to do from a state level is if you're a, a migrant or a legal immigrant, you have better health care than any legal citizen in the state of Illinois, and I think that's wrong. Right. So if you're a if you're a 65 year old, uh, you know, elderly woman or 70 or 80, you pick your age, uh, you have a worse health care plan than a migrant or a legal immigrant. OK. And I, I don't think that that's right. And also, you know, it was also signed under uh, actually Governor Rauner of the Trust Act that eliminated the ability for local law enforcement to communicate with federal authorities for those that are bad people doing bad things to move them along. And we're not able to communicate with federal authorities about immigration status. And I think that's wrong. And so from a state level, we have to take away the magnets that are bringing people to our state that are taking away the resources, the vital resources that we need for the US citizens and the legal residents that vitally need these resources, and Senator, right? Senator, and so when you, you yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. We only have a final second. I just want to get Laura quickly in here. What are your final thoughts? Um, you know, immigrants are contributing to the to the state. That insurance that the senator is talking about, millions of dollars in taxes are paid by immigrants. So they should also be able to benefit from that. Um, and so it, it, it's just it's they are not taking. They are contributing by the billions, and they are part of this of this great state and we need to figure out how to integrate them into the state. Well, thank you, Laura. We're going to have to leave it at that. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks Up so next, much for having me on. I look at potential solutions to increasing suicide rates among black and Latino Chicagoans. Stay with us.
Black and Latino Chicagoans are seeing increasing rates of suicide. That's according to a study from the University of Chicago. Mental health resources and early intervention can play a crucial role in preventing suicides, but researchers say they are becoming harder to access. Joining us now with more are Janelle Goodwill, assistant professor at the University of Chicago School of Social Work and the study's author, and Arturo Carrero, Deputy Director of Health and Violence Prevention for the Brighton Park Neighborhood Council. Thank you both for joining us. Janelle, I want to start with you. You began working on this research when you noticed a gap when talking about Chicago violence. Tell us more about that. Certainly. So I moved to Chicago in 2020 to begin a faculty position at the University of Chicago. And during that time, I began to read local news sites to get more acclimated with the community and with the neighborhood that I was moving into. During that time, I became familiar with uh, some of the writings by reporter and journalist Lakidra Chavis, who was writing about this increase in suicides among black Cook County residents. Um, I noticed that really in research across the social sciences, that there's a strong focus on homicide in Chicago, but that suicide has really been an understudied topic in this city. And so I felt like there was an opportunity to really delve deeper and to build upon Lakidra's really important work in trying to understand how suicide is impacting residents in this city. And Arturo, what impact have you seen from lack of mental health resources in, in communities? Yeah, this is a very important topic and I'm very glad it's getting attention. You know, what we've seen is that the areas that have seen the highest rates of disinvestment are also the highest areas of the city with the highest rates of behavioral health related 911 calls, right? So we've seen the impacts of disinvestment and how it's left communities without resources and unfortunately having to rely on a system of care that doesn't exist. Janelle, the study also pointed to the younger ages at which black and Latino Chicagoans are committing suicide. What stood out to you the most? Yeah, so I think that's one of the really heartbreaking aspects of doing this work is that these are not just numbers, these are family members, these are loved ones, these are friends and members of our community. And so when thinking about how to intervene, researchers and clinicians are tasked with the responsibility of trying to figure out why some groups are dying by suicide earlier than others. So in our study, we found that black and Latino Chicagoans were dying by suicide um, before age 20 relative to white and Asian Chicagoans who are dying at later ages. I think this points to the need for interventions in schools and community organizations and churches and places that families visit, whereas maybe persons who are working directly with um, white and Asian Chicagoans may think about intervening in workplaces or spaces where um, older Chicago residents are currently active. And were there patterns that you noticed of how they were taking their lives? Well, we did see some differences in method, and so this is very concerning and I think, again, complicates our understanding of violence in this city. We did see that black males in Chicago were most likely to die by suicide using a firearm. And again, that is, I think, is very understudied in this city when we think about what gun violence truly looks and feels like. Uh, but we also did see, I think, patterns that were consistent with suicide methods and trends globally where men are using firearms generally more often than women are. And Arturo, how can conversations about mental health be encouraged among young people? Yeah, it's important to have these conversations early and often, right? We want to make sure that people feel that they can get the support they need, are aware of why mental health matters, and who can, who can they turn to in a moment of crisis? How can somebody who is going through a moment that, again, is questioning their lives, who are really in a moment that is requiring critical attention, can feel comfortable reaching out to somebody? And that's very important. We want to be able to prevent and engage people uh, in a moment of need with, with care and support. And Janelle, based on your research, what can be done to help young people? What are some of the disparities that you saw in terms of like access also to mental health? Certainly, so I think it's important to highlight that we actually cite the Treatment Not Trauma report in this peer-reviewed study. So again, I think it's important to reiterate that researchers are not the ones who are going to only lead the change. This really has to be really a community effort that's led by policymakers, clinicians, researchers, organizers. And so I feel like one of the responsibilities of myself and other researchers and even in this study is to amplify the work that's already been happening, right? So I just got to Chicago in 2020. I'm certainly not the first person to care about this issue, uh, but we really amplify that think a lot of the efforts by Treatment Not Trauma and other groups that have already been happening. And so through those spaces, I think there's an opportunity to really think about the reopening and even the expansion of more publicly funded mental health centers, especially on the south and west sides of the city. And talking about that, Arturo, groups like yours are working to reopen Chicago's public mental health clinics. How will this help those seeking mental health care as opposed to those private services that are available? Yes, well, through our research, we've been able to see that when the city 
in the previous administration invested in the nonprofit privatized mental health system that already existed, the additional funding that went to these resources and these communities did not actually increase access in a way that was very much meaningful. Those barriers still exist, right? So we want to create a system of care through the treatment not trauma model that invests in the public sector where people can walk into a community mental health organ, uh, center in their neighborhood, just like they do a public library at the moment, right? Where the ease of access can allow people an opportunity to receive the support when they need it and also to create a non-police crisis response system citywide right so people can turn to a resource and a moment of need and have a peer a social worker a community resident who's trained to respond to crisis be there for them in that moment and be able to transition them to care at one of these centers right we also want these centers to provide the, the proactive outreach in a way that can inform community be engaged in preventative efforts and be able to support people and the entire community by, again, a fully funded system that can provide the resources and the care. And, and that's Arturo, what treatment of trauma is looking to do. Arturo, how hard is it, honestly, to find mental health resources for people? We see long wait lists, right? Even when those resources exist, we know that people are waiting six months to a year to, re to receive services in some cases. Or when they receive care, it's very much um, limited as to how many uh, appointments they can they can access cost is still a prohibitive barrier so we know so that you're those saying maybe exist. one therapist for a whole neighborhood sometimes actually it's point one we see wow. point one therapist for 1,000 community residents in, in no income communities of color right but com by comparison more affluent neighborhoods have four therapists for 1,000 community residents that's that's data that our research has shown and we've built a, a, a long research agenda to point out how public investment needs to be uh, created in areas of the city where, where these uh, deserts exist. Thank you, Arturo. And we, we only have time for one last question. And Jenna, I want to go to you. You have been doing this work for over 10 years. Where does your passion come from to speak out on suicide? I think that many of us who do this work are driven uh, not just by research interests but by personal experience where we unfortunately are living with and caring for either ourselves or individuals in our families who need immediate support. And so there is a sense of urgency. These suicides are happening right in front of us, uh, but they can be addressed. That We can actually implement policies that can save lives, literally. And so I'm hopeful that others will watch this today and feel like they really are in a position to help and to do something. And so I'm grateful to Treatment Not Trauma and all those other in Chicago who've been leading these efforts long before I arrived here. Well, thank you both for this conversation. Up next, what you should know about Chicago's Latino Film Festival that's kicking off today. Movie lovers, it's time to head to the theaters for the 40th annual Chicago Latino Film Festival. The festival screened a variety of features and short films from countries all over Latin America, including islands like Puerto Rico. We spoke with the film festival's founder, who tells us more about his passion for bringing stories of Latinos to the big screen. It's based on the stories that are close to our soul. I, I do recommend that people go out. It's a unique opportunity to see something different, something that will touch and move them and will stay with people for a long time. The stories are so profound and so authentic. And the integrity of these artists whose dreams become a reality, I've seen all of them from a different perspective. That's part of my job. Actually, the part that I enjoy the most because I get connected to our wow. countries. I wanted to send a different message, a true one. There are great architects who are working with one to build the mecca of the Latino culture in Chicago. Great businessmen, lawyers, medical doctors, engineers, computer-wise, and there are people in NASA flying astronauts. So that's who we are. And that's the message that we wanted to use uh, and spread by, by sharing our culture. The film festival runs through April 22nd in theaters all around the city. To find out more about the films and locations, head over to our website. And that's our show tonight. Join us tomorrow night at 5.30 and 7 for the weekend review. And we leave you tonight with a look at a cuttlefish now on exhibit at the Shedd Aquarium. Now, from all of us here at Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, I'm Joanna Hernandez. Stay healthy, stay safe, buenas noches. What a cute thing.
Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that is proud to recognize its 18 attorneys selected for the 2024 Super Lawyers List.